Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to your moderator, Ryan Darnell. Hello? All right, we're on. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us this afternoon. I know this is the after lunch crowd, so that's always, um, you know, an interesting, interesting moment. So grab some caffeine and hopefully have a good content for you here over the next 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to quickly let everyone on the stage introduce themselves, and then we'll just dig into some of the discussion topics around just really how, I mean, the, the topic of the panel is how to troubleshoot life as a co-founder. Um, where I think we really want to focus a lot of our questions and talking points is just kind of like, what do you deal with? Like, what are the hardest things to deal with as a co-founder? How do you, there's no right or wrong answer to any of these topics or questions. And just how do you, you know, solve all the different problems that are going to come up when you're trying to grow a business from the ground up? Um, but I'll start introducing myself. My name's Ryan Darnell. I run a firm uh, called Max Ventures, um, early stage, early stage venture capital fund based in New York. Um, we've made 43 investments over the last over the last four and a half years, and uh, primarily consumer focused. Thank you, Ryan. My name is Meg Raglan. I am the co-founder with my co-founder here, Carolyn, of Plum Print, and we take the overwhelming piles of artwork that your children create, and we digitize that artwork, and we turn it into custom coffee table books and other products, and we make it super easy for parents. And we are based in Asheville, North Carolina. So I'm Meg's co-founder, Carolyn Lanzetta, and the company is based in Asheville. I'm based in New York. So we have a remote co-founder working relationship. I'm going to borrow yours then. We're going to share. Uh, thank you. My name is James Peisker. I'm the co-founder of Porter Road, based out of here, Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we are uh, the world's only whole animal online butcher shop. <laughs> this is going to be fun. Uh, I'm Chris Carter, also co-founder of Porter Road, and uh, yeah, we're based out of Nashville. Yes. All right, good intros. Um, so I thought we'd start off just at kind of the origin story for most startups, which is... Uh, how co-founders interact. Um, I thought it'd be helpful maybe if you both you talk a little bit about um, one, some of the things to think about before you decide to found a business with someone. Like how do you, you know, decide you are a good fit to start a company? Because I think it's, there's a lot more thought that needs to go into it than most people realize. Um, and the second part of that, like how do you, how do you manage relationships with each, the relationship with each other over time? Right, because I think a lot of this is, you know, it's kind of like a marriage in a way. Um, you can't, you can't just like, you can't not address it. And I think a lot of these, a lot, the chemistry at an early stage company is much better if the co-founders have a really strong relationship. And my opinion is, you have to be very deliberate about that. But we'd love to hear about how, what are some best ways to do that over time. Sure. Well, I'm happy to start. So, in terms of. Um, first part of your question in determining who your co-founder should be. So um, Carol and I, our first business to get together was selling um, goldfish on our grandmother's um, front lawn when we were about eight years old. We happened to be cousins. Did you raise any venture money for that? Um, yes, we did. About 20 bucks from our grandfather to buy the... <laughs> Um, but when it came to starting Plum Print, we came to a lot of basic agreements together before we started the business. Um, but then we did have an operating agreement, and we put it on paper. Um, but as I see it, uh, a contract definitely does not hold anyone to. And when you, when you get back to the marriage example, the contract of marriage doesn't hold someone to a marriage. Yep. It really is trust and honesty within your relationship. And, and we had had that established, and that's, that would be the advice I'd give for anyone in terms of choosing a co-founder. It has to be somebody that you trust. And if there's something you don't trust about your co-founder and you think, oh, if we get this in writing, it will be okay, <laughs> I don't think that's the right co-founder for you. We can jump around too. We don't have to go, you know, just, just anyone We're not gonna jump go in, in order any every single time. Uh, well, Chris and I have a little bit of a different story. We, we knew each other for two months before we uh, became business partners. 
so a little unorthodox, but we instantly connected when we met. Actually, when we went to go sign our articles of organization, our lawyer who had known Chris since he was a child, before she pushed over the paperwork, told us that this was a really bad idea. <laughs> Which, in a sense, too. it is, but it's about trust. And I think one of the biggest things that Chris and I have learned over the years, and I have started implementing in every aspect of my life, is communication. You have to let your partner, which is, you are basically married to, um, know how you feel, what you're upset about, and if you bottle things up, it's you're going to explode. How do you do that? So when you talk about communication, sorry, if you were, how, how do you do you set aside time like on a weekly? Do you have like set up structural one on ones? Like do you have like a co-founder call where you spend like have dedicated time to spend with each other like once a week, once a month, whatever? Like what's the best way to ensure that there's constant communication and structured communication between between the early team? You know, when we started, we implemented structure, so we would have deliberate calls together and we would have time that we spent together. But as our relationship has evolved and the business has evolved, that has become a, a very natural part of our every day. Uh, I think from my perspective, the honesty and the transparency is the most important, as well as really being self-aware, having a, a strong understanding of what your own strengths and weaknesses are and that of your co-founder and being able to manage those in a way that strengthens the business. And that's really fundamentally based in trust and transparency and honesty, really. Well, I think with that being said, going a little deeper into it, it's about that communication and being able to work together and it's important to always be on the same wavelength at work and always be able to communicate through that. But it's also important as, for me personally to be able to unwind with Chris and let loose, maybe have a few cocktails, a few libations, uh, but then you, you, know, you can really open up and I feel like you can, you can accomplish a lot when you're not dressed up in an office getting things done and Fortunately and unfortunately, Chris, have spent, Chris and I have spent many of uh, long days, long nights, long weekends getting things done, and it brings us closer, you know, every extra hour you have to work. And, and another level of that is just knowing that each one of us has things going on outside of our business as well, and being able to support each other for, you know, births of children or, you know, a death in the family or something like that and just always knowing that somebody's dealing with stuff outside of work and being able to communicate that to your co-founder. I mean, you want them to basically know every single thing about you. There's no no secrets and, you know, you're you're always there to support each other and it just makes you stronger as a team. I would just add to that that I think for us it's been important to occasionally unwind with the cocktails but make a ground rule that there's no work talk, that it's personal talk, we're hanging out, we're catching up, and this is not about work. And that actually takes quite a bit of structure to put in place. It's almost impossible. Yeah, we're it's, we are not good at that. You'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you have, you have both of you worked previously together before founding your current businesses. Uh, both of you, have, it sounds like you have a lot of alignment on like culture, what type of business you want to build, work ethic, what's expected out of each other. So you've got a business and now you go out and hire people, right? And that's a big deal, obviously, because you wanna bring in the right people, you wanna maintain the culture over time. Um, but I mean, I think kind of the myth is, that I see is a lot of early first founder, first time founders, you know, they think it's kinda like, all right, whenever we need this role, we'll put a job description up and we'll go through a hiring process. And that's really not an optimal way to do things. I mean, a lot of these roles you need to see coming up you know, potentially like three, six, nine, 12 months before they actually come up. And there's a process to managing relationships with people before, you know, those actually, before you make that hire. So I'd love for, you, for both of you to talk a little bit about how do you manage relationships with people who you would like to be prospective employees before you're actually hiring for roles? And then once it's time to actually go into hiring mode, how do you shift that relationship and how do you get people excited? How do you get great people 
who have a lot of other options, excited enough to want to join what you're building and you and your journey? Well, first you move your business to Asheville, North Carolina, where everyone wants to live. So, <laughs> it's the um, highest per capita craft beer city in correct. the world. So that's yeah. a, that's the leading selling point, obviously. But. <laughs> um, I was just talking to an investor about this yesterday, um, about a position that we probably want to fill in about six months out. And he said, well, this week I'll send you a couple of names. Um, so exactly that, planning in advance and starting the conversations. I think that's a little bit easier for us in that we are in a smaller town. So if it's someone, if we are looking to hire someone in, in Asheville, we're constantly keeping our eyes open for the next bit of talent, which is a little bit different from when you're in a larger city. I would think that that would be the case. Um, but we are, we are always um, spreading the pa positive message of what's going on with, at Plum Print with others in the community and asking them to share with potential, you know, the, and, and share that, like yesterday, sharing the fact that um, we're gonna be looking for to hire a certain position in about six months down the road. So networking far in advance. Uh, James and I actually, when we first started Porter Road, uh, we were the only two employees in our business plan. We were gonna work seven days a week, eight hours a day. Um, and we were very happy with that. Uh, within our first year, we had 17 employees, so quickly out the door. Um, and we didn't prepare for those employees. We didn't you know, know what they were gonna be doing. We just knew that we needed help. And now that we've kind of restructured our business and we're in a different space, the, our organizational chart is a very ongoing, in real time conversation that we're working on. And everybody in our organization currently wears all the hats. Uh, we're gonna have very strong necks. Uh, and we, we constantly think about what we're spending most of our time on or, or where our focus is. And then, then you go back and you ask yourself, what do you really enjoy doing? What do you wanna hire somebody else to do? You don't wanna hire somebody in to do a part of your business that's your favorite part and then all of a sudden you don't have that control anymore. So it's, it, you have to be very uh, diligent, I guess, in, in, in figuring that out and really the the best way to kind of figure out that organizational chart is look, look into the future and what you want and then kind of work your way backwards and see who's gonna take on what responsibility and like I said, still maintaining the, the control over what it is that you really enjoy about your business. And just to add to that, I think the hiring process is similar to the fundraising process, to the acquisition process. It's all about cultivating relationships that build over time and eventually, in the best situations, you come to a mutual agreement and whether that is a job description that fits for both of you or that's an investor or that's an acquirer, those, it's built over time and it, it's kind of one where you come together rather than one of you laying out what you're looking for and the other one just accepting or not. So just kind of building on that, um, you know, I think one thing you're kind of hitting on is like, the narrative, like how do you, and one thing I've realized is I think one thing people um, uh, people underestimate is how important the power of storytelling is as a founder, the power of like crafting a really precise and engaging narrative about your business to multiple different stakeholders. So we'd love to talk about how you craft that narrative because a lot of times you have to have a message for prospective employees, you have to have a message for investors, you have to have a message for vendors, you have to have a message for the press. Like how do you think about creating the narrative, like telling the story of your business and how do you think about doing it in different ways based on you know, which, which one of those parties you want to you know, work with you and think favorable of you and help you? Well, for Porter Road, we have run our business since day one since it, when it was just Chris and I, to try to get to the point to would we feed this to our families? Would we want this for ourselves? Which I think constantly pushes us to have a, you know, a, a better product across the board with our vendors, with what we do. And we have taken that as we continue to expand with whether it's a new hire possibility, whether it's an investor, how are you gonna help me out? How are we together going to make a better product for our consumer, for our employees, and uh, for ourselves at the at the long run. I think I think that's a good point. And often, 
the advice I have for other entrepreneurs is always to ask, what can I do for you, for somebody else? And likewise, with an employee, they're looking for a fulfilling role at a company. How do we make that happen for you? For an investor, how do we, what can we do for you? Because that's how you get, that's how you get your story together and that's how it all comes together. And the same with the press. What does the press need from us? What can I do for you? It's always number one question. It's not about me. So you have an employee base, you're telling, you're getting all this great PR, you're seeing sales go up, um, you know, you're starting to hire amazing people. But the reality is all of these companies, even the companies that look like massive successes are always very volatile under the water on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And they, they feel like they're very volatile on a regular basis. There's, there's, there's really bad days, there's really good days, and you, know, you have to really be, you have to be able to deal with those emotions you know, as, a, as a founder, because you're inherently gonna have really good, really bad days. And um, I guess how do you, when you're managing an employee base, when you are managing a small, scrappy team that has big ambitions, We'd love to know how you manage the employee, how do you manage situations on the bad days when there's bad news to deliver? And how do you celebrate the small wins, you know, when you have a really good day, you, you close a big deal, you raise money, or whatever it may be. How do you internally really celebrate those, those, those small wins? Well, we have quite a unique business because we are online, we're e-commerce, we're brick and mortar, we have wholesale. And we have people in Tennessee, Kentucky, and New York. So to manage each one of those teams is a completely different act and it's a completely different dance. Um, our facility, which all of our meat comes out of, is in rural Princeton, Kentucky. So if you are driving out of Nashville to the middle of nowhere, you get off the highway and you keep on driving even farther and deeper into the we middle of nowhere. We all know where Princeton's, everyone knows where Princeton's at. Everyone knows where Princeton is. <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's, it's very hard to motivate a staff of people that come from a rural town that has everybody sees it on the news, we read about it, we hear it, there's a, there's a, there's a problem going on. And what we're trying to do is create an uh, atmosphere and an environment that is going to help that community for the better with the farmers, with the employees and everything. So when we motivate those people, it's in a much different sense than when we're talking to our e-commerce team in New York that's based out of you know Dumbo. It's going to be a completely different set of tools that you have to use. And once again, same with the people here in Nashville. It's, it's about how are we, how can I help you, just like you said, and then how are we going to help each other together? We're the opposite, apart from Carolyn and um, a couple others in New York. We're largely in one big room in Asheville, and then our studio is an attached room where all of our digitizing is happening. Um, so in terms of the bad things, um, we are a very open business. Nothing's happening behind closed doors. Um, and if there is some meeting or we're having some type of conference call or something in our conference room, um, I often go back into the main room and share my, my frustrations. I don't I think there are very few surprises for our larger staff as a whole. And um, I have a hard time when I'm annoyed with something, keeping it to myself. So I share it with the staff. And I think for that reason, it's very open that a lot of people share, even our customer service folks. If there is a time when there's just a difficult customer, they will hang up and share. And we, ha we have the opposite side of that is um, when a difficult customer finally approves their plum print proofs or many proofs and we see you know, an invoice is paid or something like that, um, we love to turn on, we are the champions, my friend, and we all. <laughs> and to keep, and to keep um, really to keep the energy and positivity up at the top of every hour, we have a minute of exercise um, with 10 push-ups and 10 sit-ups. And it's everyone lets out their positive and negative energy, and we all laugh, and then we get right back to it. All right, so you have, all right, you've got the business established. You've got all these things in place now. All you need is capital to grow this business, right? It's all you need. So. Um, would love to also get takes. I mean, and obviously raising outside money is not for every company, and some companies would be better off not raising outside money. 
but both of you have decided to raise outside money and have outside investors, um, and both have you know institutional funds as outside investors. So I would love to hear um, a little bit more about how you manage potentially relationships with investors before you go fundraise, leading up to that moment, and then after you close around and you have external investors, how do you manage that relationship? What, what do you think is the best ways to manage that relationship with your investors post-investment? Maybe you should go first. <laughs> Ooh, okay. Well, I can tell you, okay, so I have to raise money too, so it's a good question. Um, I didn't really have an answer prepared, but uh, it's very easy to answer that question. Um, so, I mean, I have over 30 investors in our fund, and I have to do the same thing. What I tell, I know founders a lot of times say, you know, I just I hate, I'm ready to raise money, I'm ready to get back to work, I shouldn't be going through this process, but I don't want to go through this process, I don't want it to take too long. But I, I will say one thing from my experience in raising an outside fund is um, it really makes you think clearly and articulate why you're doing this, especially if it's not an easy fundraise. So, I mean, it took me over a year to raise our first fund. Like, literally, I was fundraising constantly, or fundraising and investing at the same time for a full year. And that's a long time. I mean, most, even a long fundraise for a founder is going to take three or four months. It's a long time. And I think one thing that you get out of it, one, you really get, you really, it really makes you focus and under, under, like, really ask yourself, should I be doing this, right? Like, what am I doing that's so important? And like really articulate why you're doing it, your vision, and how you're going to be a very good steward of this capital and execute and do what you say you're gonna do. Um, but in my opinion to every, and I didn't mean to like take this question, but like every interaction with an investor, whether it's an email, whether it's a five minute serendipitous situation, just randomly at an event, um, with a phone call, whatever, has to be managed so meticulously as an investor or as a founder, anyone who's essentially asking someone for money. So that's, I guess, my quick bang, brain dump on that, but we'd love to know how you guys think about it. I, I really enjoy the, the fundraising process. Um, it, it really goes back to what James was talking about. I mean, as, as our relationship exists, it, it all comes down to communication, which I think is kind of what you're getting at, Ryan, is, um, you know, those phone calls, those emails, uh, being diligent on responses, it's all about signals and, you know, you, they're always watching you. And then to maintain the relationship, I mean, I spoke to two of our largest investors this first thing this morning. Um, and it's, you've just got to always be available. And, you know, these guys have a question and it's Christmas morning, you, you got to answer the question. I mean, they, you know, you got to be there uh, and, and ready to uh, present to them at all times. But I mean, I, I enjoy going out and doing the fundraising process, we get to go around and basically brag about our business and, uh, you know, and hope that people enjoy to hear what we're talking about, which has always been fun for us as well, because we're not your traditional venture backed company. We, you know, come from Nashville, Tennessee. We're not uh, a coastal company or we're not two business school graduates. We, we started this business eight years ago and, and decided to expand and, and kind of rebrand and launch our onside, our on, what is the, uh, online, I know it really well. Um, and uh, so it, it was, it was, it was different for them to actually hear somebody come in with an existing business and, and, and just pitch a new aspect of it. Um, and then communication is the number one answer. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say we just, we look at our investors really as teammates. I mean, that's, they're part of the broader team and the way we treat our team is with honesty and transparency. I think the most important part for communication is just staying in front of everything. You being the one to reach out as much as possible rather than fielding the incoming questions. I think that gives investors a sense of confidence in you. It lets them know that you're looking out for them um, and that you're thinking about them and the questions that are on their mind. So to me, that's kind of the most important. Well, we, in our relationship, I think I'm very fortunate because Chris absolutely loves taking care of the investors and handling them. And I'm on the opposite and I handle all of the employees and all the workflow. So it works out really well for us because both of us are available 24 seven to a different set of needs going on. 
where at any moment Chris has talked to our VCs and our investors that we've done. I've already talked to our farmers and our general managers and being able to separate that out and have that point person and have that person that you know is taking care of almost all 50 of the people in our family, in our company, uh, on different levels and different ends. Yeah, and I think transparency is such a huge part of it. Um, I think being prompt about updates, I think getting in a cadence, and I can see, I see, I've seen 43 companies go through this, right? And I've talked to investors a lot, and you need to really build trust with your investors over time. Um, and there's nothing that's more, they can build trust faster than being very prompt about things. Like if you send a monthly update, send it, you send that five days after the end of the month, every time, like you, I know you're on top of your stuff, right? And just being transparent, like everyone knows everything's not going perfect. Like everyone just walks around and says, oh, we're, we're crushing it. Like what, it's not that easy, right? And every, uh, the reality is most investor updates, if you're being honest, are gonna have, here's some things that are going really well, here's some things that aren't going really well, and here's how we're trying to fix it. Here's some things we could use some help on. Can anyone help? Um, and I just think being very, to being on the other side of it, and I kind of play the middle role between my investors and the people we invest in, but I, I just think if you want to build trust and you want to get people to help you, like do, start, starting from there as a baseline is like the best place to start, and then you do your own thing from there. And the investors have all seen it. Yeah. They, they've gone through these speed bumps, so to not use their experience and their knowledge is a little absurd. I, there's, we, we, I've, we've had an investment in a company, and then the company was actually doing really well, and every update was just like nothing but celebratory exclamation marks. And I was just like, what? Something's not right. <laughs> like, like, something's not right about this. Um, but it turns out I was right. But like, you just can't manage your, you can't act that way because people know, people know that what you're trying to do is really hard, and there's always gonna be good things happening, and there's always gonna be challenges, and I think it's really important if you're talking to investors who have investor rights to be just open about that. Everyone, everyone knows that, so. All right, so you have investors. You, you both sell products, and you both, you both run a business that's generating revenue. It's a transactional business. Um, so you have, this, you have this balance that we've talked about a little bit in other panels that's how do you think about long-term, how do you balance long-term profitability with, the, with certain growth rates with external expectations? Like, how do you think about that? Obviously, you don't want to continue to raise money and dilute yourselves, and obviously, you want to grow in a smart way, but how do you manage that balance post-investment, post, uh, or some frameworks to think about managing that balance after raising outside money? Well, I think what Chris and I have done, we started our company with a very small family investment and opened our first day fully stocked with, what was it, $500 in the bank account? Um, so... Is that a soft bank round? Did soft bank do that to the Vision Fund? Pardon me? <laughs> no. Just kidding. Uh, so it, it's been, as we've continued to grow and we became profitable, we never, we never felt like we needed to take much out or we always just took enough what we needed to to survive. And I think that's given us a keen advantage of after we did go out and raise a large hunk of money, we held onto it very tightly and wanted to make sure that we were using it very wisely because we have been into a point in our company that we had no money and you have to figure out what we're paying for, how we're gonna do it, and when is this check coming in that this person's owed me. And, and now that you have it, I think it's vitally important to take that same mentality, that same theory of what do we need to do to survive and how are we gonna continue to grow? And I think that's using your funds very wisely, making sure that you're not overextending yourself or making sure that you're not rewarding yourself too much because finalizing your fundraise is not the victory. That's the starting point of the race. You just succeeded in starting your life and your career. The end result is whatever it means to you as business partners, as a company and what it is, but the fundraising round is the most vital start of what you have to make sure that you don't overextend yourself, you don't have to refund raise, you don't have a lower evaluation, and so on and so forth. I also think that uh, the balance between growth and profitability, while 
it would be lovely to say that we control that balance. That's just not the way it works. I mean, <laughs> there are times when you're forced into, you know, with, with low funds, you're forced into getting the profitability in any way you can scrap it together. And there are other times when you're really focused on growth. But to pretend like we're sitting here, you know, mapping the whole thing out in a perfect manner is just a load of shit. I mean, that's not the way it works. So just going on what James said, you guys go five years basically and you, you know, you really bootstrap your business. You, you know, you know, you can't spend what you don't have. You have to keep a positive bank account. Then all of a sudden you raise outside money. You've got a seven figure bank account. You hire new people you've, and your, your, your operating expenses go up. So you're losing money every month. Describe that feeling, and then you have external investors who say, who said, you know, you've, you've, run a, you've run a business, which you two are the only owners in, and you can kind of do kind of whatever you want to do, basically, as long as they have a positive bank account. But now you have external expectations, you have a board, you have all these things. Describe that feeling, like, that, how, what, it, what it was like to make that transition, because it's different, a different, I'm sure it was definitely a transition for you guys. Yeah, um, we, st we stay very on top of the budget. Uh, it's all about the budget and the models um, and plugging in every little thing. I mean, coming from, you know, being bootstrapped and never doing any advertising and really, you know, if somebody came in to sell us a corner of the bottom of a native magazine, we were, you know, beating them up pretty hard to, uh, to get it down to like $500 because that would be, a, you know, a big jump for us. And now you have hired a guy that makes more money than you that's spending all of your money on marketing and it's like, why does this make any sense? And it's it's funny because I feel like I leaned on investors to kind of tell me that this is the way it's done. You've got to build the business before the profitability comes. Because in mine and James' mindsets originally, we would say, stop spending the marketing money and we can just keep that in our bank account and then we'll have it. Um, but it's, it is, it's, it's a really strange like balance to, to think, you know, you have to spend in order to, to acquire the new customers. And then the lifetime value of that customer has to come back around in order to give you that profitability. And just as much budgeting and as much uh, far out, like forecasting. forecasting that you can get done, uh, the better you can sleep at night, which is a joke. That's, I really don't sleep. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, it's, 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 it's how do you do it? I think it's just like you do anything else. You just you just do it. It's uh, it's. I wish that there was some way that, you know, a book that you could read that would tell you exactly how to get it done. But that doesn't exist. So, yeah. Last thing I want to hit on was PR, because uh, I mean, you obviously getting people to, you know, anyone can go out and buy Google ads, buy Facebook ads. But a lot of times, both of you sell directly to consumers, right? And a lot of times. You, you know, to whether to grow your business the right way or to access more capital down the road, there, you really have to do a good job of, in a way, winning the, winning, the, winning the tactics of getting the press to tell your story on a national level, right? And that getting is, them to tell it correctly. That is very hard to do, right? And it's very hard to get people to, 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 to write about you, and, but at the same time, uh, it can also be extremely valuable when when you get positive PR, right? So we'd love to just maybe give a few ideas and thoughts around, you know, best way to to tell that story at a national level and best way to just get consumers. Because I mean, let's be honest, like it's never been easier to start a company. At the end of the day, um, it's never been harder to stand out and like really get people's attention. But it's never been easy to actually start from ground zero. So with that in mind, you're you're competing for the consumer's attention. How you know how do you manage that process? Well, Meg and I found from the very start that we needed to be telling our own story. So we've never used PR agencies. We've never gone that route. This was always a story that needed to be personal and that needed to be told from our perspective. Um, similarly to the hiring process and to the fundraising process, we cultivated those relationships with the press very early on. Um, we would do a lot of it just through Twitter, frankly, and that ended up paying off in huge dividends, and it might have been three months, six months, a year down the road. 
uh, but it has paid off tremendously. And getting national spots on huge you know, t morning TV shows and across national uh, media platforms, and that was all due to our work. Uh, and we would set a, aside time each day to be out reaching out to people, whether it be on Twitter or email or um, Facebook. And we, we hit every channel we could possibly get to. Um, and I think it resonated hearing the story from us directly and not from a, an agent or somebody trying to, to pitch a story um, as one of 20 different clients. Um, so we've 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 used we use an agency currently for PR, um, and we've had good agencies and we've had bad agencies, and it, it's it's all about the relationships. And if those if that agency doesn't have a good existing relationship with writers and somebody in uh, the press, then then they're not they don't care if you're an agency. They're not going to invite you in. They don't want to answer your phone calls. Um, but for so I, I, for us, an agency has been very useful. It's, you know, it helps us into a market where, you know, we're new since we have brought in the tech aspect of, of our business. So we needed that, that help, that, that foot in the door with our agency, and they've done a fantastic job. But for us, it's, it's, it's very important since we come from a meat business. I mean, there's a new Netflix documentary every week about the meat industry and, and how bad it is. And since we work so hard to actually to turn that narrative around and actually put a positive light on it and make it a sustainable product that we're selling. Um, we could sit there in the PR world and point out what everybody else does wrong or what makes it so bad, but we make the choice to really push what we do positive and what we're doing to actually change that market as opposed to trying to start a fight with one of these huge giants. We just stick to our guns and we do what's right and that's what we've done you know, since the beginning of our, our business. And, uh, we think that that's just really important, and our PR has taken to it very well, and they, they vet stories pretty good now as they come in. James wants to say something. Well, I think with that being said, like, yeah, he absolutely correct, but that's also one of those growing things that we, we never had a PR company. We never had advertising. We never had marketing. That's one of those growing pains where, you know, you lean on your investors and you say, well, what do we expect? What do we do? How can we help it? And they're the ones that are going to tell you, yeah, you have to spend that much money if you want to be in the big name publications. You want to be in, in front of mass amounts of audience. And, yeah, you have to pay to play to be a part of it. And we were able to tap into those connections and those resources through the PR company that we work with right now. But it was one of those things where when we got our first PR bill, I said, what the... If there is a founder in the audience who's thinking about, you know, using a PR agency, you know, obviously you said you had had really good experience, you had one experience that wasn't so great. What's one piece of advice you'd give them, you know, before you make a decision? Maybe one or two tough questions to ask before you before you decide to partner with someone like that. I mean, I think it's just like like us, you know. <laughs> vetting and choosing the VCs you want to look at. You look at their portfolio companies, you look at what they're doing to, to help and guide them. So it'd be kind of the same thing. You, you talk to your PR company and who, do you, who else do you work with? What kind of traction are they getting? What uh, exposure are you helping them receive? And you know, if it lines up, yeah, exactly. They're your voice. And I mean, our PR company traditionally is a fashion first uh, PR company. And it's, you know, bringing uh, online meat sales business to their their clients is, is uh, was very new for them. So it was uh, it's very much a learning period for us to inform our PR and get them up to speed as quickly as possible so that they could go out and be our voice and you know and answer questions. And it got it gets to the point now to where they'll send us over mocked up questions in their form over to us to, to revise and put in the facts and everything and kind of clear up and then we'll send it back to them and they make us sound smart. Uh, and it's, it's, a, it's been a great relationship. But I mean, honestly, just looking at what they've done and who they work with is. Yeah, and I would say before you hire them, have them pitch your company to you yes. to see if they, you know, if they one. get it at all. Because just as you've said, people have written about you incorrectly. Um, you want to make sure they get it before before it even begins. Smart. All right, we have about 
um, I don't know, five to 10 minutes left. Does anyone in the audience have any questions for, for the panel or anything they'd like to ask or? Hello, Ooh, that's loud. Uh, my name is Rachel, I'm an MBA student at Vanderbilt. Um, I have a question kind of about investors and your how they looked at your relationships. Did you find that they scrutinized your relationship as co-founders at all or did that not even come up? Well, well, I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So, for example, you talked about, um, I think you were meeting with a lawyer and she made a comment about, oh, this is a bad idea. Yes. Um, I was wondering if investors scrutinized your co-founder relationships at all, um, like with each other, yeah. or if it didn't even come up about, you know, yeah. you guys are cousins or your friends or something like that. Yeah. That definitely came up. James and I are very much co-founders. We've done everything in our business together. Um, and you know we never had a separation as far as titles. And one of the first investors we sat down with was not even, I don't think he was even interested in, in our business. And it was really throwing us to the wolves. Uh, and this man just ate us alive. Uh, and he said, he said, well, who's in charge here? And we're like, we're both in charge. And he was like, no, that's not gonna work. No, it just, he made us choose. He's like, who's gonna be what? I was like, I guess I'll be CEO, our CEO, and you can be CEO. And he's like, all right, great. So, yeah, they, they, they did. A little uh, more thought put into it than that, just <laughs> for the record. but That's exactly how it was. We pulled him out of a hat. Uh, no, I'm just playing. But it was, our roles fall into those titles, but those titles were not necessarily anything that we ever thought about that investors did expect. And, and we did have that in the beginning, that if you have a, uh, if you're co-founders, two partners, you can't have a 50-50 relationship. Who's going to be, you know, who's going to have 51? And we went with 50-50. Um, and, and they lived with it. I would just add that you should hope your investors look very closely at your co-founder relationship. Because if they don't, you don't want them investing in you. Yeah, because it's, it's like a relationship. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be good times. I can honestly say there has been times where we have been screaming at each other. And it's what, how you get through it, just like any relationship. It's not what's happening now. It's how we're going to resolve it and how we're going to push forward into the yeah. future. And one and sorry, go ahead. I, didn't know if no. I was All just going right. to say from the investors end, I think one thing that we do to answer your question, too, is you, you, you meet with these people multiple times before you invest, right? And you really pay attention to the genuine, genuine chemistry among the investors and you really dig into their background and say, what have you guys and girls worked on together, right? Like you ran a goldfish company, that's something. Um, but at the end of the day, you wanna really look at this and say, is there natural chemistry between these people? Do they have a history of working together in some form? Is there gonna be any surprises? And like, is their skill sets complementary that are gonna be value added to the business at the end of the day? Margaret. I knew you guys could hear me. Um, I'm Margaret Dolan. I'm with an independent consulting company called Neil Strategies. And um, one of the things that interests me from you as founders is you heard our, our gubernatorial candidates this morning talk about an environment that fosters entrepreneurialism and growth and innovation. And I'm curious about whether you guys as founders took advantage of an organization like Launch Tennessee for you Tennesseans or in North Carolina and if you were able to get help, and if you weren't able to get help, what would you want from an organization like that in order to make your path easier? Yeah, that's a great question, thank you. Um, so in when we moved uh, Plum Print to North Carolina, when we were just a year in before we had raised money, we, right from the start, um, grew a lot of partnerships, both in Western North Carolina, in Asheville, and in the greater North Carolina, a lot of programs. We were part of a business incubator um, that was sponsored by the EDC in North, in, um, and the community college programs in North Carolina. And we definitely utilized um, those, especially coming into um, an area where we didn't know anyone. I think it was great for fostering relationships and networking and finding out what local resources we could use. Um, and then that led into when we raised money. 
um, that we already had been out there uh, working with uh, a lot of the movers and shakers, both in Raleigh and across the state. So that has been very beneficial for us, both in advisory roles and when it came to fundraising. We, we were fortunate enough to really have close relationships with some of our investors that were able to help guide us through the process. So we didn't necessarily lean on um, any advisors as far as um, helping us through the process. But if, if we were, and if I could go back, and what I think really is important to know when you go out fundraising is, is understanding the term sheets, understanding your, your dilution, and, and really what you're getting into is, is, is as, as you fundraise and, and sell off parts of your company that you know is really a part of you, um, and understand like the, the ramifications of what you're doing by going out and fund, getting fundraising done. It's not just going and getting the money for your company. There's a lot more that's tied to it. Um, we have a great understanding of that now, but I feel like it, some guidance in that area up front would have been would have been really nice. It probably would have saved us multiple hours. Well, I think we're out of time. Um, so thank um, you very much. To one more question. Okay. <laughs> thank you. You're kind. Um, I just I heard you all mention earlier about being prompt and just really living in your integrity to have a great relationship with investors. And I wondered if each of you would say something about the work habits that have you think have really led to your success. Is there something that you do every day that you think is just really key to how you got yourselves and your businesses to this place? I, w I was going to say this earlier. I think when we were talking, you asked a question about our relationship and did we have a did we have a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting together? Um, well, in the beginning, we were so in the throes of the business that in the day to day, we would just be in the business. Um, and it was so it was actually after we were home at night and our kids were in bed, we would get on the phone at 8:30 at night, and that's when we would have our daily meetings. Was from like 8:30 to 10 p.m. And that definitely in the early stages was our work habits that I think really moved, and that's when our major decisions were made um, because we didn't have time in the, in the day to day. The relentlessness to make it work. Yeah, life is not a straight path. You can have a plan that goes straight forward, but it's what you do with the detours and bumps along the way that makes you successful. Thank you. Um, give a round of applause for Porter Road and Plumfront. Thank you.